All right, hey, gents, welcome back, Tactical Rifleman. I am here with Randy Rawhide Worth, uh, one of my greatest heroes, one of my mentors. Uh, Randy, uh, be, besides being the generation of special forces ahead of me, he's, he's as old as I am, this guy is incredibly uh, ancient. I love you, brother. You know, I yeah. do. But uh, Randy is also a uh, founder of the Worst Case Scenario Survival School. Yep. But he's also the guy that wrote the survival portion of the SOCOM SEER manual. So when you talk about stuff like this, subjects like this, he's literally the guy that wrote the book. Um, so what, what we want to talk about today is uh, caches, basically from uh, making containers to so site selection to actually uh, in placing and then uh, recording and reporting your cash with what we call a cash report so that other people, if necessary, can actually go back and recover your cash. So uh, this is an important subject simply because, uh, it, and there's lots of talk in the news today, people are worried about they need to hide their belongings, firearms, stuff like that. I wish people wouldn't get all bent out of shape, but the reality is if that's the way your heart is leading you, this is the video you need to watch. Also, uh, for the prepper survivalist community out there, a lot of people, if, hey, if you live in the big city or suburbia and you know you need to go get somewhere else, obviously you can't haul all your stuff or uh, let's say you want to put supplies along the route. That could be anything from food, medical supplies, even fuel. There are ways to cache fuel. Uh, and I, I know people that do it. They, in national parks all along uh, I-40, I know a guy that to get from basically North Carolina all the way out to his little hidey hole, he's got caches set up at national parks the whole way. Not going to bust him out by name because uh, he's a great American. So anyways, uh, Randy, we're, this seems like such an easy subject. Uh, want, let's start with the actual containers themselves. All right. Um, most people have heard about the PCV pipe. So what we have is a six-inch PCV pipe. I don't want to get into great detail. Here's some of the things you need to know about it. You have to wrap... If you're going to put stuff in there, you have to keep it where it's going to be dry, where it's not going to get, gather moisture. Uh, one of the oldest techniques is using rice. What do you call these, Call right here? These are uh, basically pronounced like decibel. It's uh, desiccants. They're little uh, packets that are designed to absorb oxygen out of the air, absorb moisture. And uh, they turn these. This particular type actually turns pink when they're ruined, so you know when you're putting them in. Okay. All right. So, if it's going to be food, the they also have these bags here. Mylar bags. Mylar bags, and you can seal those with your wife's um, what a curling iron. Yeah. And it'll you can suck the air, push it out, seal it up. Uh, rice is an old school one because it gathers moisture and keeps it dry inside. So if that's all you have, you can use uh, rice. If you were to use something like um, that could rust, anything that would be metals from firearms, you name it, maybe tools that you have, you're going to have to put some type of lubricant on it, usually silicone, and I would silicone the cloth and put it in the cloth of silicone and then put your, uh, your moisture uh, gathering material, like rice or these bags right here in there. Now, when you go to seal it, I don't have it in front of me, but uh, what I'm going to take on the lip, I'm going to take um, petroleum jelly, and I'm going to line the inside of this with a petroleum jelly. The reason I'm going to do that is because once I seal and put it on here, and it's put in its place, it's going to be very hard to take off. That petroleum jelly is going to allow me, once I break this seal, to be able to pull the top off. The same thing would happen with... Uh, the ammo can. On the edges, I, it's got the rubber. I've already sprayed um, silicone spray on it, but I will take 
where the joint is here, I'll put the petroleum jelly and a petroleum jelly all along these edges here. So when it's sealed and I need to open it, I can get it open. That's something that people overlook. Now on that, uh, there are people that talk about, you can buy these lids that actually are, have a threaded cap. Uh, that's fine, except it adds a lot to the cost. Uh, nothing adds, like for example, this six inch PVC, this was, what did we say this was, seven bucks? Seven bucks. Seven bucks. To go to the eight inch PVC pipe, the pipe is not that much more expensive, but the larger diameter of the cap raised the price to over, was it $30, $40? It was yeah. a crazy yeah. amount of money just to go to an eight inch cap. Now, even in six inch caps, going with one that's threaded uh, where you can actually pull the thing out, uh, there's a removable cap from the inside, it sounds like, well, that makes it easier for me to recover it. Randy's just showing you how to make it so this will pull right off. One, and two, if you use a smaller inset cap, now the hole is smaller. So if you couldn't get, if you could barely get your rifle or your material into the six inch pipe, you're definitely not gonna be able to get it out of that hole. Either way, you're gonna end up having to pull the whole cap off the end. So just food for thought, think about uh, what items you're trying to store and whether you can easily get it in and out of that size pipe. You can fit rifles in here. Sometimes you have to disassemble them. Sometimes you got to pull optics off. Uh, so and that's why larger ammo cans, things like that are often used. Yeah. Okay. Now, one other thing in this, we're going to go through some different stuff. But once I've got my material in here and I've got my sealant in there that's going to gather the, not sealant, but it's going to gather the moisture, I've put my uh, petroleum jelly in the inside. And then I set the caps on. This goop is plumber's goop. And this is my favorite stuff that will go on the edge when I put it in along here. So the Vaseline lets this go on easy and come off easy. Right. Now I can take my knife and break the edge when I want to get it out. Or you can use lighter fluid, um, even uh, alcohol will dissolve this. Okay. So you, but if you don't have the petroleum jelly, you're not going to be pulling these caps off. Same way with the cans. Now, Real quick, we'll go into some other different cans. Carl talked about uh, stuff if you didn't want to have it in a long container. Uh, maybe it couldn't fit or maybe you don't want to dig that type of long hole. Well, I'll hold this. Carl's got a uh, larger can. And with this, you can put all kinds of stuff in it. And if you were interested in firearms, you can break down like um, ARs and put in this this can here they would fit in this size and can. cool part about the military is you can go to most army surplus uh stores and, and this and this one's basically designed for mark 19s and things like that but they make tall cans uh they make uh you can get the ones for transporting um the large artillery or tank yeah. rounds where rifles will easily fit in them now one note see how this can is painted black uh Metal cans, just the military paints them to protect them from the elements above the ground. But once you bury it, that moisture is surrounding it 24-7, 365 days a year. So you can spray the outside of these things with a rubberized spray paint like, spray, uh, like Varathane or new stuff, Flex Seal. You can find it everywhere. You can go to Walmart and you can buy Flex Seal. That's a rubberized paint. Coat the inside, coat the outside, and then once you're done uh, sealing it the way Randy's showing you, I, again, uh, you can spray a couple more coats on it. It's not going to make it any harder to open up. So different size military surplus cans. Let me go where this can from. This is Carl's. It was shot with a 50 cal. They have still photos that I hope can be put in this video. So the bullet went all the way through and blew the can out. In the still photos, I showed you the equipment that I used to make it like what it is now. The tools I used to put the can back in shape and seal it. Seal it. So duct tape is on the inside. This goop goes on the outside. And flux seal is on the in and outside. It takes several days to do that. This is completely watertight and will hold water. That's my test. It's got to be able to hold water and not leak out. So I'll put it on the inside. It did. It's sealed. It's sealed and I turn it upside down, it's not going to leak out. So this can is complete. Now when you do your 
um, flex seal on it because that's what I use. I put um, masking tape along this edge here. I don't know if you can see that. And then over where the, the, this top comes off, where the can fits. So the flex seal doesn't get in the way of the can closing and sealing. That's important. Make sure you do that and then take it off when you're done. So this can is ready to go. And before we get into this real quick, because I, I got a lot, I know you got a lot of other stuff okay. we need to share with them. We're going to take a quick break so that YouTube can slap you guys right in the face with another one of their uh, ad commercials. So we'll see you back in a minute. All right, welcome back. I hope you enjoyed that commercial as much as I did. Randy, you were just getting ready to tell us about this can. All Why right. do you have a paint can? All right, this is uh, one of the modern cans and it's plastic. Now the reason I brought it is because I can cut this off and I can use this for a cap, okay? I can also use it to put stuff in and seal it, okay? Just as it is because it's plastic. I would still use this goop on the outside, but on the inside, mm -hmm. I put the Vaseline so I can get the top Make off. Make it easier to open again. Right. But I can cut it off and put it over one of those cans. The end of the PVC pipe. PVC pipes. Hmm. Or I can use it as a cache can. One of so the things, you're saying with this slid over the top of the can, now all you've got to do is pop that open. Right. And that would be the correct diameter. And, and probably a lot cheaper than one of those screw-in yep. uh, plumbing ones. Awesome. Great idea. Next thing is the dry bags. We use a lot of dry bags in Special Forces. These can be buried and, you, and they're completely dry. They'll, you can put these containers stuff in and you can put rice in you want, but it's a dry bag. It gives you another option of burying stuff. It doesn't have to be a hard container. So it can be something How like long this. would this last if buried? So you, in other words, so if you, only, if you knew you were only burying it for a couple weeks, you wouldn't, uh, this would be yeah, this would Good work enough. for that. If, if I'm going to have it for a long time to a cache across the United States, yeah. I'm going to need a solid container. Okay, awesome. Okay, and then um, because it's pliable and stuff like this, it's easier to dig the hole and put it in. So it has some advantages. All right. And because it has no metal, somebody coming by with a metal detector trying to find your cache is going to have a much harder time finding that right there for sure. I just, Awesome. Hey, let's talk a little bit about site selection. Um, okay, everybody thinks we'll just go find that hole in the ground, but the reality is there's, you need to be tactical about this, and that's the part that a lot of people don't grasp. So you want to talk a little bit about uh, site, uh, the actual site selection? Okay. I got to put this in the civilian terms because military, we have a lot of assets to help us do this better. You don't. So when you're doing a site selection, you've got to be able to get into it and you've got to be able to get in, out of it without being seen. One of the things that you've got to remember is you've got to visit the site, you've got to look at it physically, and you also have to notice what the people are doing the outside. When do they come and go? What is the best times? Because you've got to go in places. You've got to go dig this hole and bury it. So you need to know what the population is doing in that area. So it has to be somewhere you can get in without being observed and get back out of it. Um, you, we have covered an approach. Sometimes you don't have that, so you're going to use night. Your best time to go doing uh, things like putting caches is from 2 o'clock to 4 o'clock in the morning. Very difficult for people to stay awake. So if you don't have good cover and consumer or approach, you can use time to do that. If you knew the area, it may change, and you may be near a time where there's no one around. It may be midday. I don't know, but you gotta you gotta physically um, go to that site and see it and observe it. Another thing you need to consider is how easy is it gonna be for you to come back and find it, and not necessarily just you, but if you uh, actually do a proper cash report. Uh, you may need to send somebody else to go get that cash, and uh, so you need to pick a location that's easy to find. You're not just burying treasure on Oak Island for it to never ever be found. You you need to find a location. So in other words, you need landmarks, what we call attack points to start from. Right? And when you start doing that, uh, okay, I'm gonna go to the big oak tree and I'm gonna go due north for 50 feet. 
that's great until somebody cuts down the oak tree or catches a bolt of lightning or falls in an ice storm. So you need to weigh, the, is this a permanent landmark or is it a semi-permanent landmark? Trees come and go. Uh, but so in other words, a more permanent landmark would be something like a cell phone tower or power line towers, paved roads, intersections of paved roads, things like that. That would be considered more of a more permanent landmark, right? Um, concealment while, while digging it also, you, you've got to be able to have that. Yeah, you, that's important. That's why the time period, going and looking at the area and seeing and observing what the comings and goes of people are is important. Now, uh, people don't think about water table. You got you to gotta know what the water table is. Especially I don't know the, here, where I live. Yeah, yeah, Florida, they've got a problem. So you got to be careful on that. Then you also have um, the ease of digging. One of the reasons why you want to go out and do test sites in this area is so you can see what you're going to need for tools. You don't know what you're going to need for tools until you start digging. So uh, a variable of tools, post hole diggers, shovels, and um, uh, straight bars, what it's called, pry bars. You need to have stuff like that to get in there. If you're around a bunch of trees, that sounds great. You've got, you've got good cover, but if you're around trees, now you're digging through roots just you know, remember that rocky areas, you know, if there's lots of rocks, obviously you're not gonna be able to dig that deep. So you gotta take that in consideration. And then on that, you've also got to consider uh, how, easy is, how easy is it gonna be for me to can't re-camouflage this thing? Uh, and we'll get into it when we're out at the hole, but um, basically as you're, you're pulling the dirt out, layer it, but when you put it back, how, how easy is it for me to hide where I dug and uh, in place this thing. All right, so what do you say right now? We'll, uh, let's go actually show them the hole and then uh, we'll come back and we'll talk about the cash report. Okay, one other thing about it. Um, don't cut anything or make any permanent marks uh, going in to put your cache part. The camera guys that are filming us, I cut the brambles and the things that'll stick them in the eyes when they're walking, don't do that. I only did that so they could get the ease to get in there. Do not uh, mark your site by cutting things to get in there easily. Leave yep. it like it is. All right, so we're out here at our cash site. Randy's already dug the hole. Now, obviously we would be out here during hours of limited visibility. We're doing this during the day for you. When do you scout and find this? Uh, you don't go out looking for your spot in the dark. Go out during hunting season, like you're scouting. Go out while you're hiking. Find a place during the day because at night you wouldn't be able to see, oh my God, there's a, there's a house right there. Oh my God, there's this or that. This site, uh, great selection, all right? Great, uh, great site. We've got a little ravine down the back. Now, uh, you can move roads. You can put new roads in. You can build houses. You can tear barns and towers down. Trees grow and die ravines and cuts and rolls of the landscape, they're pretty well always gonna be there, so that's a great landmark. One of the other things we have here is there's a dog leg in this fence. That's gonna be a very easy and very prominent uh, uh, landmark attack point, as we would call it, for us to find. Now, the reason why those don't change is these are property boundaries. This is actually between three farms right here. Now. Wooded area where we're at here, we've got uh, the truck parked in a defile. Now this is a wide open field in the back here, but you'll notice there's a rise behind me. So in, this does several things. It gives me open field of view while we're here if anybody's getting close within a couple hundred meters. But if somebody's past 200 meters, there's no way they could see me here. I would not show up on thermals or nothing. So we're completely good here directly underneath the barbed wire fence. This is pros and cons, but uh, one of the pros of this is somebody coming by with a metal detector. Obviously their metal detector is gonna go off because of the barbed wire right here. Now, we do have lots of trees. Now, what this, the, the problem this gave us was uh, roots. So when Randy dug this, he brought Maddox handles, he brought his uh, saws, he brought all of his pioneering tools out here. Randy, what's the tarp for? 
Well, the tarp's to put the wood, the uh, dirt on so that I can put it back in the same layers that I pulled it back And then out you of. don't have a big spot of uh, dirt right. right there. And I can take it, move it, and hide it, whatever's left over. It's hard to do that if it's just piled on the ground, so I always put it on the tarp. Now, earlier you mentioned about having other pieces of metal. Uh, so as they dig down, they find your site with the metal detector, they start digging down, and they find a basically a decoy piece of metal. You mentioned something about them being aged properly. Can you go a little bit more about that? Yes, these actually come from sites that I've dug around where I live in the area. Um, this is one of the oldest pe pieces. It's really worn, it's been underground. So this is one of the pieces that's gonna be buried the deepest. This is the next layer that was underground. The reason it's going to be close to the top because on this side you can see the paints here, but this was actually underground. So these are going to be in layers. This is another piece. Now I can't, if you cut something to make it fit this hole, this is a little bit too long. That's an indicator. You don't want to make any cuts on anything you have. So that would be down to bare metal. Right. But this would be something I would lay over probably about a foot over the top of it. One of the last things that I might put on there. Okay, so it's different pieces of metal that have been worn in different uh, time periods in the ground. And you've got to make it match. Nope. You, you can also use trash, but it's got to come from, uh, it's got to be aged. Cor you, the you correct get, error. Right. Where do you find stuff like that? Actually, uh, people are pretty trashy. You can find uh, exactly. where old houses and stuff has been, that's when your best places mm -hmm. to go. We're not saying you have to go to traveling road show and start hitting antique stores and buying objects to bury. We're not saying that at all. Get out and while you're hiking, you're gonna come up on stuff. I see this stuff out four wheeling all the time. Now, uh, in our cash report, our actually written report that we, we had, right? Uh, you actually mentioned in here that when we get done, you're gonna place those bottles back over the top. Now, uh, Random bottles, are those aged? What are they? These are actually dug about a uh, half inch into the ground is where these were. So they're from this era, they're from here. I don't know how long they were there here. I don't recognize these bottles, but they have screw tops, but it fit the area, they were already here. So I'm gonna use those as my marker when you find this place and you find these bottles. Now they'll be put in a a uh, certain configuration also which will be marked on there to tell you that these are the bottles you're looking for. And I'll describe the bottles. It's important to do that because you may not be the one that's trying to dig this back up. The, again, these came from here. Now, old school, because Randy is old school. Randy is very old school. They would actually draw, literally draw on the cash report exactly how those bottles were laid so they would know Hey, these are the correct ones. Modern era, remember, we're gonna take all these documents and we're gonna turn them into a PDF. You can literally take a picture of those bottles and uh, add it to the report. Still draw it if you want to, but understand that uh, you can take a picture, all right? But uh, caution you against using the, the uh, flash on your camera, right? Uh, you can do low light settings, just take a quick picture of it and uh, uh, all right, let's, let's get into actually putting this stuff up, putting it in the hole. Okay. Now the container's already sealed. I'm not gonna go into that. We already did that. So what I'm gonna show you is how I'm gonna tie this on. Carl, hold that a minute. Now. Why are you tying it? Oof. Okay. Because I'm the Yahoo that puts, these, put because, these in. Oh, <laughs> uh, that's one of my jobs when I was in Special Forces and I made the mistake got down to it, I'm standing on top of it, and I didn't figure out how I was gonna get it back out because it was the length of the hole. So trial and error, so that's how I learned this. So I'm gonna come around, this is gonna be a technique I use for doing logs. So uh, I'll come around this side, go this way. Now, I'm gonna come back over it. I'm gonna do it once, twice, three times, pull it tight. Then two half loops, one, two. Now that's on there. Now I don't want to cut this 
rope here. All this has got to do is go through this right here, right? So now it's attached to it. And they don't have to tie it to it. It just has to run through the handle. So I, I don't want to cut the rope to do that. So now I'm going to drop this in the hole. All right. Bye-bye. Now, the can's going to be on top. I'm going to take this rope to about here. I would cut this rope about right here. It's got to drop back down inside the hole. <laughs> don't leave the rope hanging out. Okay? You guys got that. You don't leave the rope uh, up sticking out like a, like a wick on a candle. It's not to help you find it. The rope is there to just help you get this big uh, pipe out of the ground. Now you're going to have the dirt on it. You're not going to be able to get it off. You might damage your container, but because this is going to go on top of it. Remember, I run it through there. So that's where the rope is going to lay. So I can reach down, grab it. Then all I got to do is pull it back up just like this. And with it being covered with dirt, it's going to come up. Believe me, it works. Been there, done that on the t-shirt. All right, Randy. So we've got it in there. You've got your, you've got your tail on it to make it easier to come out. Um, What's the importance of putting the dirt back in? I know you've got it all in a neat pile, but did you actually separate it carefully by layer? Why are layers important? Because they're gonna dig it up and it's gotta match the layers that it's gonna be in there. The other thing is because I had to go through all this work, if you're gonna dig my cache up, I want you to have to work. So the last part that was really kicking my tail in was all these rocks. So guess what? At the just about three, four inches above this, that's where these rocks are gonna go back in. So I'm gonna layer it just as I took it off. The last of the dirt that I can use will match the top. I don't want clay. If you can see the difference, it's uh, light colored and this is black. I can't have the light colored on the top. So that's at the bottom. It's on the tarp so that I can get and move and take the dirt off whatever's left over. But underneath the tarp is the exact um, leaves and branches that I pulled off. I saved the exact stuff that I took off of. It's going to go back on that. Those bottles, just as I found them, they're half buried about, probably about an inch, two inches into the ground. That's how they're going to be left. That's how I found them. That's how they're going to be done. The leaves will be, were over the top of them. So this part of our little pretty blue marble we're on, uh, we've got about six, eight inches of dark topsoil here. The rest of it's all clay underneath. Make sure you put it back in now. If it's very definitive colors, you can use several tarps and actually separate it nice and pretty. But if you've got a little bit of overlap, uh, it's really not that important. But the big thing is when you're done, you've got to put all the leaves back and everything. Yes, uh, more leaves will come down, but uh, just be careful, you've got people coming by just a few days later. The, you taking the extra 10 minutes, you're tired, I know. You just filled this hole back in. You're tired, I got that. The extra five, 10 minutes you take right now to camouflage this thing, it's gonna be well worth it. All right, so uh, we've talked about filling the hole back in. Uh, we've talked about uh, our landmarks here, how we found it. Again, map and compass. Uh, from our attack points, in this case we're using the dog leg and we're using the uh, end of the main road up there that's paved. It brings us into this location, we've done our whole, let's go back and actually talk about making the actual cash report itself. Okay. All right, let's go do this. All right, so we've got our cash in the ground. We made us a, uh, Randy drew us up a nice little hand-drawn map. All right, we took our compass settings, we, uh, we did our pace count, and uh, that's awesome. Now what we're gonna do is we're gonna create what's called a cash report. Now, guys, I, I, I hate it for you, but we're not gonna give you the textbook military standard for doing a cash report because it, re it uh, requires a lot of stuff that does not pertain to y'all. So what we're gonna talk about though is basically doing a cash report and basically all it is is it's the set information needed and along with this you'll have that hand-drawn map you'll have your uh, 
topographic maps that we do uh, for the area. And then we also include satellite imagery, both um, micro, uh, I'm sorry, macro and micro. It all will become our nice little packet and scan it and put it away somewhere digitally and uh, pray you never need it, all right? So, but what goes into this? There's a lot that goes into this, yeah. a lot. All right, so we're gonna tell you how we made our cash report. Randy, start us off, this thing's awesome. All right, daytime group's important. What that tells you is how long that cash has been in the ground. That's important for people to know that. We use a 10-digit military grid system. You can use the GPS coordinates. Uh, Carl's talked about how uh, detailed those can be. If a guy prefers lat longs over military grid reference system, that's personal preference. Yep. Uh, you also have your pace count. That has to be put in there from your known attack points. All right. Uh, now you have to describe the cache actual location. It's important to know um, what you have in that cache, food, clothing, survival gear, guns or ammo, wh whatever you're caching, you've, there's got to be a report of that so they know what they're going to so be doing. So if you out. have three different caches, why would you go to the one that just has medical gear and fuel when you really need uh, something else? In other words, know what's in it, and that way you're not having to... Uh, uh, having to dig up all your holes, just dig up the hole you need to get to. Absolutely. All right, uh, now some of the details of the hole, you need to give the people the size of the hole and the depth of the hole. That's important because they've got to dig that back up. Now, you're going to put the dirt back in as you took it out, but you should put in some type of, um, if it's metal stuff, if it's food, don't worry about it, but if it's anything metal, you're going to take metal from the area that would be in that depth or aged and you're going to layer in through there so a metal detector is going to find that metal. I can't stress how sneaky that is, right? Because what if you didn't catch what Randy just said, somebody digging because they think they're in the right spot, right? If they think they, you know, uh, they came by with a metal detector and they're like, ah, I found Randy's cache they start digging and now they find uh, a old Pepsi can from the 30s or something. They go, oh, shoot, that, that's what I found. So Randy's actually talking about layering trash for the appropriate time period. Now, that's awesome because it's gonna make them quit before they get to the correct depth. And that's why it's so important you tell them in the cash report, look, you've got to dig three feet, four feet, six feet, because those uh, those little tricks Randy just did to throw them off are gonna do the same thing to your person that's trying to find it. That's gonna make them want to quit. But if they go, well, hey, I'm only at two and a half feet. Randy said I need to go four feet deep. I'll keep digging. So it, it is, that's very important. All right. One of the other things that I'll do is I'll mark the actual site with some type of trash I know that should still be there that I found in that site. And the one we're going to go to is two bottles that I dug up with are right there. So that's going to be my marker. That will be in my report. So that indicates to you uh, from the, one of your last things that you'll have is, oh, okay, these two items are here and they're in a certain f uh, configuration. Okay. And that also is an indicator that you're in the right spot. Best time to dig your cache. We, we covered that. You've got to go to the site and you've got to know what the is happening in the population in your area because it may change. Basic rule I said before is two o'clock to four o'clock, but that may not work. So know your area, you have to go there. You have to go there. And it's important that you put that in the cash report because it may be different for different areas. There may be uh, times uh, where all the traffic that comes in that area is in the nighttime or at zero two in the morning. So, uh, it, there's a time period that may be better for that specific site. Don't just always assume it's going to be two to four in the morning. That's not always the case. Yeah. All right. Uh, details on um, traveling to the Cache site. Uh, you've got highways, you have roads, you have uh, trails, you have paths. One of the things on trails uh, and paths you've got to know, if they're marked, sometimes they're not numbered, sometimes they're colored. 
that all has to be in there because someone hasn't been there. You may not be the one recovering this. You have to do this so that they don't make a mistake and that they can find this cache site. Amen to that. All right, um, just on a side note, uh, the person that's going to go pick it up may not be the survival expert that Randy is. So do a test cache. You don't even have to put anything there. Uh, but literally have someone else use your cash report. If you think this is the perfect document, this thing's awesome. Look how pretty it is. I've got grid coordinates. I've got pace count. This is great. Give it to someone else. Give it to your teenage son. Give it to your neighbor. Give it to your best friend and have them actually go out and try to find your test cash. And what you may find is you may not have put enough information. Things that you assume are given may not really work. So uh, do a couple test cash reports and see how well they can be followed by other people. Randy, is there any other information uh, that's needed to travel to and from the cash site? Yes. Um, Carl gave an example of somebody knows that's gone cross country. So listen to what I'm saying. You need. It sounds funny, but it's not. Give the state, give the county, give the city, give the town of the site that you're gonna, you're starting to narrow it down before you get into the minute details, you've gotta bring them to that location. So that's extremely important. Uh, road names, highway names, state roads, markers. Um, let's see, uh, trails like I covered, talked about before, lots of trails don't have numbers, they have colors. Yeah. That all has to be in there. Um, what do you put into a, uh, like a detailed map? What are we looking for on that detailed map? All right, one of the things we talked about was attack points. These are points that are recognizable that you can find to start. Easily. Yeah. Right, uh, as permanent as you can get them, but they also can be landmarks that are going to be there like, um, uh, God, we've been in the Middle East so long, wadis, uh, small ravines uh, where they have uh, trees growing or crops growing, the shapes that come and they put a fence line in. Some of that is going to start indicating that you're in the right area. Um, now, when you get to this point, you're probably going to be on foot, and that's where your pace count comes in, and you're going to start... Um, uh, using your pace count to find uh, your site. So because you can't always rely on GPS to, right. to get you to that exact spot. Um, I always took for granted that everybody knows how to do pa uh, pace count. You know, even my wife learned uh, map and compass in college. Okay, apparently not everybody does. Uh, what's your best way to do a pace count, learn a pace count? All right, on a pace count, you have to do it two different ways make I don't care if it's 100 yards or 100 meters whichever you prefer right personally. make it a, a, a flat area and then get uh, uneven terrain and make a, another 100 meters or 100 uh, yard now you're gonna walk that probably five times the odd number you're gonna take the average number of steps it took you to walk that just the left foot or the right foot. Right. don't count every step right uh, it, it is only when I, I'm right-handed, I use when my right foot hits the ground, okay? When that hits the ground, that's one pace count every time it hits, okay? Now, after doing it on the flat ground five times, they take my average, mine 62 steps for 100 meters. Mm -hmm. Then you got to do um, uneven train, mine 67. So it's going to vary when it's uneven train. You've got to know both of those because you don't know exactly where your cache is. I also use my compass uh, to give me directions for my attack point also. So it'll have a pace count, but it's also going to have a direction with a compass. Simple, from your attack point, you'll put it in there, all right, lay it in 60 degrees. I lay it in 60 degrees. All right, now, from this attack point, I'm going to move uh, 180 meters. Okay, how far is from here to there, 180 meters? Am I going to use a laser range finder? Actually, you can. Yeah, you yeah. can. But, uh, you know, you, as a backup, you need to be able, you need to know uh, your pace count. And if you don't know your pace count, literally, it's literally that easy. You can go down to the local football field and just count paces going back and forth. Don't think 
one uh, one step is one meter, right? Because most people's pace counts are different. When I did uh, SF selection, I had a pace count for running on gravel roads. I had a pace count for walking cross country. Uh, I had a couple different pace counts. I even had one for time for literally running wide open because I wanted to be able to make up time. Uh, obviously, the, the running one with time is not as accurate, but for covering longer distances and hitting that next attack point, it would work, right? Um, before we wrap this up, um, I, I got a break for one more commercial break. You okay. good with that? I know yeah. you hate commercials, Randy. One more. <laughs> one more. Yes, sir. We'll see you back after this final commercial. All right, man, I hope you guys enjoyed that last commercial as much as I did. <laughs> All right, um, how do you get good, guys, burying this stuff is easy. Uh, gluing PVC pipe together is easy. The hard part about caches is in placing them correctly, but also being able to go back and find them. Great way to practice this is there is a whole network of people out there. You can find them on the internet. They do what's called geo tracking. They go out and in place the little uh, markers. It's just a little waterproof container and they have fun with it. They drive all over the US. You put them at nice historic sites and they go around finding other people's caches. You get it, uh, you find it with your GPS, you open it up, it's got a little log book. You can write your name in there, leave little notes, trinkets, whatever. And then you put it back for the next guy. This is a sport, a great way that people meet people, but um, it's also a great way for you to practice uh, using a GPS cross country with vehicles and even through uh, dismounted. However, I caution people to not always rely on a GPS. Shit hits the fan. Um, that there's no guarantee that your, your GPS satellites will be up in place and it only takes the loss of a couple of satellites to greatly degrade the effectiveness of GPSs. Just because you're getting a GPS signal, a GPS signal that's locked onto five satellites is insanely accurate. A GPS signal that still says you're getting a good lock, but it's only on two satellites that's only pointing in from two directions, it's not gonna be that accurate. And unfortunately, a lot of people relying on that in their vehicles, they're, they're going to be screwed. So anyways, learn, learn the skills of land navigation with map and compass. I can't stress that enough. Randy, um, just sitting around the fire with you, chit chat and talking about caches, like you mentioned, the Middle East. This guy has done ops, not just the Middle East, but uh, pretty well all over the planet. Yeah. Crazy nutcase that you are. All right. Um, Share some of the tricks and tips that you've seen other people use on the other parts of the plant because we can learn from all these other uh, groups of people that use these skills. Okay, they, uh, one of the things is never bury your cache on your own property. That's the first place they're gonna look. Amen to that. That's one of the things in one of the countries we're in that they pointed out to me. Um, one of the easiest places to do stuff metal, throws metal detectors off they were using on ramps and off ramps because you've got the big you got the, the big, big rail metal and there. stuff yeah. there and it's just the time that you're going to place it and take it up uh, that was pretty ingenious the depth of it um uh the different materials you put in there those are things i learned from these these guys cut the ears off dogs so that they can hear better and yet they can come up with some of this fantastic stuff never underestimate people from third world countries you Special Force, we, we say, uh, be flexible, Gumby, absorb that. It's important. Um, now, last thing about when we talked about uh, getting in and getting out, for God's sakes, do not use white light. You've got to do this in the blackout. If you're going to go in at night, do not turn lights on. That's going to indicate to somebody something's going on. That's one of the last things I'm going to say is everything will be blown to heck if you cut trails into somewhere and you don't use what exists. If you use light, if you make too much of a signature where your site is, you, you're gonna get found out. Yeah. One added, uh, we mentioned metal detectors a couple times, but we also mentioned camouflage. Camouflage is not just visual, all right? Uh, 
things to throw off. He mentioned dogs, but the biggest thing, if people know there's a cache in the area, they're going to be using metal detectors to look for it. You can throw that off. One of the best ways to throw off metal detectors, uh, especially with EOD units and stuff like that, is just trash. Literally, uh, putting your cash up where like an old barn had collapsed down and there's lots of uh, sheets of tin there. There's lots of nails in the area. Uh, but again, Randy mentioned earlier, if you're going to use trash like that, collect it up from an era that, uh, that's appropriate for where it's being found. Because if you're sprinkling brand new nails and crushed Pepsi cans, uh, you're not you're not leading them away at all. You're like, hey, this, this has been put here as a marker. So be smart about your camouflage. Camouflage is not just the freshly bought Gucci flies from the hunting aisle at your local Bass Pro Shop. No, that's, that's something that people want to just take your money. Camouflage is blending in with the environment right there and hiding something in plain sight. Yeah. All right, uh, Randy, dude, uh, I hate that we even have subjects like this, but the, our, um, what Green Berets are simply uh, Boy Scouts with guns. Yeah. So the motto, Green Beret, I mean the motto, be prepared uh, for the Boy Scouts, Green Berets, we take that to the upteenth level. I'm yeah. a big believer in being prepared, big believer in uh, being able to take care of the people to my left and right, and I believe this is a great skill for us to be able to share with our viewers out there. So I appreciate your time today, brother. Well, and uh, any questions, any comments, because we have a lot of other people in our community that also have got great, uh, great tips and techniques. Uh, leave all that stuff in the comment section below. You know I read all your comments. And um, uh, yeah, just uh, give us some ideas for future videos. All right, uh, a lot of our equipment that we use personally you can find at our website, tacticalrifleman.com. We have a whole separate page just for companies that we love, and uh, you get your promo codes and stuff there. All right, so that's all I got. You all take care. Shoot straight. If you like this video, make sure to like, comment, and subscribe. Also, make sure you follow us on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter so you don't miss out on anything.